Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Danica. I'm the Deputy UK Chapter Manager for One Day Sooner. Um, so here at One Day Sooner, we aim to advocate for human challenge trial participants, and we highly value the use of open debate to inform researchers, policymakers, and members of the public about the ethics, risks, and benefits regarding human challenge trials. Now this year, the UK became the first to approve and start controlled human infection studies for COVID-19. Um, also known as human challenge trials or HCTs. Um, but knowing the ongoing SARS-CoV-2 characterization study at the Royal Free Hospital in London is using the Q-COVID algorithm to set a cautious inclusion threshold. We know that this factors in ethnicity. So now that the eligible pool of trial participants in the UK are getting vaccinated, there has been debate as to whether it is ethical to expand the criteria to allow those from other countries to volunteer and participate in the current and potentially future COVID challenge trials to be conducted in the UK. Although there are still many eligible trial participants for the reinfection study, the, um, that trial is focusing more on how the immune system responds to a second infection as opposed to developing new vaccines to facilitate equitable vaccine distribution globally. <laughs> still with me. Um, so with many countries still unable to vaccinate their people, there is clearly still a need to develop vaccines that are easier to manufacture and distribute to lower to middle income countries or LMICs and as HICs, higher income countries, including the UK, are now reducing lockdown restrictions. We want to discuss if the social value of continuing to research for global needs, as opposed to mainly the UK population's needs, outweighs the increased risk and ethical dilemma of expanding the risk allowance of human challenge trials to allow those from LMICs to volunteer. Um, now, so to discuss this issue, we have two great panelists who have already contributed to the discussion around diversity in challenge trials. We've got um, Paul Debele, who is a senior research regulatory specialist and professor professorial lecturer in bioethics at the Department of Global Health at George Washington University. And we've got One Day Sooner's own Zachariah Kafuku, who is um, a molecular biochemist and Mandela Washington Fellow, um, currently serving as One Day Africa's manager. Um, he is a prospective volunteer for COVID-19 human challenge trials and a staunch advocate for human uh, for vaccine equity and believes that clinical trial diversity in a scientific uh, is a scientific requirement even more than it is an equity one. So um, to start us off, um, I have some questions. Um, I will ask some, a panel some questions, hopefully open up a discussion and then we can, um, we'll open up last 10 minutes for the audience to submit some questions if they'd like. So um, I'd like to start with, um, right, considering we already have several developed vaccines, how do you believe human challenge trials can be used to help further the current pandemic response? Uh, uh, identifying additional vaccines that we can use Right. For now, we have got uh, several vaccines that are being uh, used and uh, all of these vaccines uh, are different in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, efficacy. Right. So for uh, for now, what we also need is to have uh, vaccines that can also uh, deal with uh, the uh, emerging uh, variants. Right now, we're dealing with uh, uh, the Delta uh, variant. Uh, we also need some uh, boosters for some of uh, the, the vaccines that we already have. And I see uh, human challenge uh, studies playing an important role there uh, because they'll basically ensure that uh, we cut short the whole process of uh, you know, testing these uh, products. We are in a pandemic and I think we need to uh, adopt a different way of uh, thinking. Uh, as um, uh, the, world, the world community, uh, we need to put our heads together and uh, find ways in which we can cut short uh, these processes so that at the end of the day, we are able to save more lives. Thank you. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a very good point that, um, that, that uh, Dr. Ndebele has raised. And uh, also I wish to say thank you for, for having me on this uh, very important discussion. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And uh, 
more more to the point of uh, the need to identify other vaccines that would be useful in fighting the pandemic. I think it it goes without saying that there have been several uh, vaccine candidates in development, different stages of development from the time that the pandemic began. Uh, so far, the vaccines which are licensed by World Health Organization clearly have failed to meet the demand, the global demand. And this is why we have seen that the, the wealthy countries or the countries that have the power of purchase have prioritized their citizenry. And the resulting situation is that the, the low and medium-income countries around the world are left without nothing or very little uh, vaccines available to them. And this situation is likely to continue according to estimates up to perhaps 2023. Now, this is uh, about two more years from now, but can we imagine what the devastation is going to look like if we have to wait two more years? How many lives are going to be lost? Uh, economies, how many of them are going to be you know, uh, disturbed? So there is obviously an urgent need for more vaccines. And if the current authorized vaccines don't seem to be meeting the market demands, then obviously there's need for us to continue to, to develop the vaccines that have been in the development process. And uh, for the most part, these vaccines, for them to be developed, they need to be tested, they need to be trialed. And now the, the interesting scenario is that uh, in, in these developed countries, the vaccination rates have gone uh, quite very high. So how do we manage to do these tests? Because the, the manufacturers, the producers for these vaccines are located in the wealthy countries where people have been vaccinated extensively. The need is in the poor countries. So how do we bridge that gap? I think I'll, I'll end it here for, uh, for the moment. Yeah, thank you, Zachariah. Um... I'm pretty sure our uh, few our next questions will <laughs> help um, give a bit of context as you go on. Um, so I imagine both of you were just as concerned as I was when you discovered that people from ethnic minority backgrounds were actually more likely to die from COVID-19. Um, do you believe that this increased risk is a sufficient reason to exclude or um, exclude diversity in challenge trials and why? So would for, like to stop. Okay. <laughs> for me, I would uh, I would actually go in the opposite uh, direction and actually say that uh, that in itself uh, justifies uh, diversity. In fact, what we want to do is to ensure that uh, all the uh, the vaccines that are going to be developed actually uh, work well for the different uh, you know uh, uh, groups. So I would actually say that would be a very very strong reason to ensure that uh, we have uh, diversity uh, in all the clinical uh, trials so that as we are addressing uh, the, the, the health needs of uh, the dominant in society, we are also at the same time addressing the needs of uh, the weaker uh, parties in our society. So I would actually argue and say that that would actually be a very, very strong uh, justification uh, for uh, diversity. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Danica, for that question. So, uh, for me, I think it is uh, to a certain degree true that uh, there are certain ethnic groups that have an increased risk uh, uh, towards the exposure of uh, COVID-19. But then the the problem with that uh, simple narrative of just saying there is increased risk is that it's it's blinding, right? The, the best way to, to, to look at it is to use a multi-factor risk assessment uh, method, whereby you don't just pick white and black and say who has a higher risk. There are a lot of factors that must be considered in a clinical trial. When uh, scientists or researchers are developing the, the trial protocol, there is a number of factors they need to look at to, to decide the best selection criteria which also does not only meet the scientific need for diversity, but also meets the ethical need for, for safety of the participants. Now, by combining these two things, we, we actually notice that uh, if we consider the multi-factor risk assessment as a method of trying to set the best criteria, 
you will find that, uh, uh, for example, uh, a 19 year old um, black woman, for example, has a lower risk uh, in terms of COVID exposure, has a lower risk than a 29 year uh, old white man, right? Just, just if I was just to put it based on age, for example, right? So there's a lot of factors that must be considered without just making a blanket statement that uh, this ethnic group is at a higher risk, so they should be excluded. Rather than putting you know, a blanket exclusion uh, statement, these should be considered, for example, uh, on the factors of sex, on the age, comorbidities, lifestyle, and other, other factors that come, come, come into play. And once these are assessed, then you actually find that some of the you know, non-BEM groups are actually at a higher risk than, than some individuals within the, you know, the, the Black and Asian minority ethnic groups. So there's need to, I think, look at this um, criteria from a broader angle than just you know, uh, ethnicity or, or skin color. Um, thank you. I mean... And, and perhaps just, just to add, if you look at uh, the, the politics of uh, exclusion, I would actually say that uh, when you look at uh, research oversight, uh, the way we have been operating as society is like a pendulum, right? So when something uh, happens or if we know that there's something that is happening, we tend to always move in the extreme end where we say let's exclude this particular uh, group from our clinical trials. And then later on, we then realize that by excluding that particular group, now we don't have data on that particular uh, group. A good example would be pregnant women uh, and also children that we have been excluding from clinical trials because we have been thinking that uh, they are vulnerable. But now we know that when you go to the pharmacy and then we buy uh, the, the, uh, the medicines, we see it's written not tested on pregnant women. Uh, so now what we're trying to do is to ensure that we include, we find safer ways of including pregnant women in research. So at the end of the day, we still need to be careful with uh, the politics of uh, exclusion when it comes to clinical trials. Yeah, and just to, to bounce uh, off that one, I think just in addition, it's, it's actually very, very, very true uh, that we can't just put out a simple exclusion statement without going through the, the depth of who the beneficiaries are intended to be. Because uh, as a principle, as a principle, the reason why we carry out clinical trials on humans is because we want to use those drugs on humans. We cannot do trials on, for example, uh, uh, monkeys, for example, to, to say that, and then expect that the results or the data or the drugs produced from that trial explicitly and perfectly fit the human system. The very reason that we have to do clinical trials involving humans is because we want to use those uh, therapeutics for humans. So by that logic alone, by that logic alone, there is a need that every you know, ethnic group or every group of human beings residing in different parts of the world, bearing different genotypes or you know, a gene pool and things like that, then there's a need that they too must be considered during the testing phase during the clinical trial phase. There's, uh, there's an argument and there are words that I normally uh, refer to uh, Professor Obaka uh, from, uh, from Canada. He once said that using drugs on people that were not involved during the clinical trial phase is like actually testing on them. So if you're going to give people drugs that they were not involved, during, they weren't involved in during the testing phase, it is as good as you testing those drugs on them at that point. This is why it's very, very important that every group of human beings that are intended to benefit from said drugs or said therapeutics must be equally involved during the trial process. And we can go on to, uh, I guess, talk about the scientific value of, uh, of diversity in, in, in clinical trials from the biostatistics point of view. Uh, you know, when you pick a sample, a sample must be truly representative of the population from which it is taken, right? We, we can't just take uh, people in one family 
and test them against uh, whatever disease or, or drug and, and expect that those results can be extrapolated to the whole world. It's not possible because that's a very limited gene pool we are using. And the, the, the world is much bigger with a greater diversity and variation. So the same logic that we are using that we cannot test on one family and say these results should be applied to everyone is the same that you cannot just go in one country and say these results should be applied to everyone around the world. There is a great need, if not uh, ethically, there is a great need scientifically for the, uh, you know, for the diversity to be included in trial protocols and implemented during said trials. Um, thank you very much. Um, just on, ex like, great discussion there, just expanding on that um, a bit, uh, because also in research for this event, um, I found loads of articles on structural racism in medicine and how they can, you know, reproduce pre-existing health inequalities between ethno-racial groups. So, um, but considering many ethnic minorities are disadvantaged due to social injustice and therefore wouldn't be considered eligible under the WHO Working Group's report um, on the criteria for ethically acceptable COVID-19 human challenge studies, um, because their inclusion could be considered unethical from participation because their inclusion could be considered unethical exploitation. Um, so how would you suggest we tackle the structural racism to ensure human challenge trials are representative and just as beneficial regardless of one's race, especially with the WHO's recommendation kind of going against that? Zek, would you like to? Yeah, um, I think uh, off the top of my head, uh, the reasons that have already been given uh, on the scientific need for uh, for this inclusion and more diverse trial settings is the same that is, I guess, uh, uh, forwarded by the World Health Organization. The, the very scientific principles from one end and then the, the need that has been there for, for generations now, the need to, to get rid of these old existing structural racism uh, issues in not just in, in, in the field of medicine, these have been there in, in, in different, different, different areas and different aspects of, of human uh, civilization. So this would be actually one of the, the first areas where an example should be set, if I may use that term. An example should be said. While we have these uh, uh, the guidelines from from WHO, right? The problem I imagine is on the part where you know the research organizers or research um, developers have been given so much power with regard to the trial protocols. It's, it's, it has been seen and it has been noted that many many uh, people go on to develop trial protocols. And they keep those somewhat like state secrets. They are hidden, right? So how do you, how do you, from an outsider point of view, assess or evaluate the they said they said trial? How do you check for all these things if they are actually meeting the checklist as it should be? Uh, not just I'm, I'm I'm trying to move away really from just racism alone, but for me I believe on the science of it. So how do you make sure that the checklist is fully fulfilled uh, on, on this aspect. That's why I do, I do think and I do believe that this uh, structural, structural racism has to be defeated at every level. So from, from policy, from regulation, and even at the very, very tip end of the clinical trial itself, these must be removed. Now, when you hear a statement suggesting that uh, this group of people will not be included in this trial because they, for whatever reason, maybe they are at a, a higher risk than said group without going through what I was talking earlier about as in the multi-factor uh, risk assessment, then that sounds very much like structured exclusion. I, I'm, I'm avoiding using the word racism. That sounds like a very carefully structured exclusion criteria. Right. So these are some of the things that we should be talking against. These are some of the things that we should be, you know, uh, trying to get rid of. 
And if I may even expand on that, we have heard so many times, so many times uh, people talking about, you know, the, the developed countries, for example, and being the, you know, the holders of the knowledge, being the, the world leaders in science and innovation, and at the same time, painting the global south and other, you know, low and medium countries to be charity cases. Now, when an opportunity arises where everyone should be involved, an opportunity which is presented by a global problem in the form of a global pandemic, there must be a global response. There must be global collaboration. There must be global partnership. And that, that is not just about the, you know, the, reg the regulations to do with how to handle these pandemics, but everything about the pandemics, regulation, including the research itself. You know, it, 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 it is sad really to note that the data that is being collected in some of these uh, clinical trials is presented in such a way that it looks as if it was befitting for the whole world, right? And that, that's a problem. That's why even now we are finding situations where a given, a given uh, a drug, for example, a given vaccine in one country, same vaccine in one country, when the local regulators try to assess the efficacy just to you know, confirm, they get a, a given result, maybe 60%. Same vaccine in a different country, they do their own evaluation assessment, they get a different efficacy level. Same vaccine in another country, why all these differences? Because the populations vary, because there's diversity, not just uh, you know, in terms of the, the geography and all, but even in terms of the people living in different, uh, different places, their, their, you know, their immune systems respond differently. Uh, this, this has been said uh, so many times, sorry to, to be going on. This has been said so many times that, uh, you know, as I speak as an African, that Africans seem to be very immune to many diseases. <laughs> Why is that the case? <laughs> because we have been exposed to so many of these agents from a young age, right? So the immune system of an African to many diseases is different from the immune system of a white person uh, from, from Europe, for example, who has not been exposed uh, uh, to these agents. And on, on that account alone, there, there must be need that all these groups must be brought together so that you have a truly representative group of trialists whose data is going to be truly representative of the global population to fight a global pandemic. I think I'll, I'll end there. So. Yeah, so uh, to add there, I think history is full of uh, examples where the, the powerful in society have actually abused uh, the, 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 the weak, uh, you know, uh, groups within our uh, society. And so whenever we see people looking at uh, initiatives with uh, suspicion, right, it's actually because uh, they are learning from what happened in history. So to me, the important question is, so what? So to me, the important uh, issue here is uh, to ask ourselves what steps we are taking to ensure that we fully involve those minority groups in research. How do we carry them along with us so that they become a part of uh, uh, the research enterprise? So the dominant groups would always be volunteering for research because they feel they've always been part of the research enterprise. They have been benefiting from uh, you know, the products coming from the research enterprise. What we need to do is to ensure that the weaker parties are also empowered so that they feel that they are part of this whole uh, process. Now, uh, specifically, uh, when talking about um, exclusion of certain groups, you would also see that some of the major research funders are now emphasizing on diversity because of the realization that there are certain groups that have been left out uh, of uh, clinical trials. So when you're writing your proposal, you're expected to address issues around diversity. Who are you going to include? What steps are you going to take to ensure that there is diversity uh, within your clinical trials. And specifically going to uh, the WHO uh, document, I think here we also need to be careful about uh, uh, how we define vulnerability, right? 
if we look at uh, the, the, the previous uh, publications that uh, look at vulnerability, you would see then that in some, uh, you know, pregnant women have been listed as, you know, vulnerable and all that. And now we are challenging that kind of uh, thinking. This is why we are now emphasizing that we want to ensure that the different groups actually involved in uh, research. When it comes to exploitation particularly, I want to ensure that when you are uh, conducting research that involves the various uh, groups, right? Now you've brought these groups together. You want to ensure that you're addressing all those things that an outsider might look at and say that this particular group is actually being exploited. So what I'm trying to say here is now when you've put together a whole group which is made up of people representing various groups, you want to ensure that they are going to be treated the same Right? so that they feel that they are part of one particular uh, trial. So it actually means uh, we have to take steps uh, which are aimed at ensuring that even those from the minority group would actually feel that they are an important part of that particular uh, trial. Um, thank you. Uh, just to lead on from that, um, so you spoke about having to consider what we actually do define vulnerability as? Um, do you have a suggestion in mind? So for me, when I'm looking at um, uh, the issues around uh, vulnerability, for me, I've always been thinking about, uh, you know, thinking of special groups or special populations, right? And then think in terms of what makes this particular group special and think in terms of how you are going to involve, to involve that particular uh, group so that at the end of the day, when you have your findings, you're actually saying you have taken uh, on board the needs uh, of uh, that particular uh, group. So certainly there are some uh, individuals that you might actually term vulnerable, right? Uh, here we are looking at, let's say, those ones who are not, uh, who are really not able to make decisions by themselves, like those ones who are having uh, some uh, mental health, uh, you know, uh, issues uh, and so forth and so forth. But if you are looking at someone who is clearly able to uh, absorb uh, information that is provided through the informed consent process, someone who is clearly able to make their informed decision. To me, I don't categorize that person as a vulnerable uh, person. I might actually say this is actually a special uh, you know, category and classify why I would term uh, you know, that person as someone who belongs to that special you know, category and still find ways of ensuring that I'm addressing the needs of that particular uh, category. Thank you. Um, do you have anything else to add, Zachariah, or shall I move on? Uh, uh, so uh, as uh, Dr. Ndebele was, was talking about um, vulnerability, I was just thinking of a question. Right now, when you consider what is happening around the world in terms of global access to vaccines, really, who is vulnerable right now? Who is, who is who's vulnerable? Who is in a vulnerable position right now? Uh, is it the global south? Is it the global north? <laughs> is it the people who have no access to the vaccines? Is it the people who have access to vaccines? So th there is, I think like Dr. Ndebele has mentioned, there's a very uh, dire need for careful consideration of what this uh, statement of vulnerability uh, should look like. Because while, while there's exclusion being uh, being perpetuated in terms of structure or what or whatnot and maybe to some to some degree and i can understand i can perhaps relate not conclusively though that when you say that a certain group of people are are vulnerable and therefore you don't want to exploit them right and those people say i want to do this or i want to be involved in this where do we place the volunteer agency who who holds the power to make a decision for a fully grown person, a person with mental faculties and process, you know, uh, cognitive processing ability? Who should hold the power to call that decision for, for such a person? Uh, to a, to a great extent, I do agree with what um, uh, and they really say that there is need for informed consent, and once that process is fully satisfied, all the tenets of that process are met then we can no longer classify someone as vulnerable and therefore protecting them or you know, hiding behind the statement of protecting them from exploitation. Because 
uh, if you actually think about it carefully, this whole exclusion is what could be classified as exploitation. Because when you, you're trying to control the means of production so that the, the products of that process remain in one location while others are you know, uh, suffering the, the consequences of the pandemic, Th that sounds like a nicely orchestrated scenario. And the, the definition of what a vulnerable person is or should be is what should be carefully considered in other narrative. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, so with that idea, I mean, you will discuss a potential, uh, so with human challenge trials, one of the things that justifies um, such a direct and difficult trial is that, um, uh, it's a social value that could result in human challenge uh, from human challenge trials. Um, but in the UK now, all those over 18 are eligible for the vaccine. Um, but um, And because of this, the social value for British trial volunteers is a lot lower than those in Africa, for example, um, and other countries that still do not have access to the vaccine for everyone. Um, so would you argue that the social value for human challenge trials still remains the same now even though it's not um if it's just using british volunteers um and should these should the social value of human challenge trials be measured globally or domestically yeah so i think as we look at uh, those um the british volunteers they are playing a very very important role not for the british uh, uh society but for the whole globe because the findings that are going to come out from uh, those trials will uh, apply uh, to people in, uh, in uh, Asia and also uh, in Africa. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us a new way of thinking. We have to think in a different way. For me, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm in the US, right? But if people who are in Asia, people who are in Africa, are still uh, being infected uh, with uh, COVID-19. It actually means that I am not safe, right? So what we are trying to say here is when we are in a, in a pandemic uh, setting like this, we have to think about ways of ensuring that we are addressing uh, these issues globally. So I become so worried when I, when I hear of, uh, you know, a country right now which has, got, which has vaccinated uh, less than 2% of its own population, and I'm looking at uh, uh, the United uh, Kingdom that is vaccinated a large proportion. I'm looking at the US that is vaccinated a large proportion. But as long as we continue to have those uh, disparities, it actually means that as a global community, we will not be able to address this pandemic in a permanent uh, way. So I think we need then uh, to ensure that when we are thinking about social value here, we are thinking about it in terms of uh, the value to the global society, to everyone. The safety of someone who is in uh, Japan or uh, in uh, Zimbabwe or in Namibia also means that I, who is uh, in the US, you know, becomes safe. So to me, that's the way I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing we need to think in this uh, current uh, environment. And uh, additionally, I think the I just want to stress on the point of the, uh, the emerging variants uh, caused by the mutations. So think about what happened in Israel. I think when, when the vaccines first became available, Israel was among the countries that were leading and they went so far in terms of vaccination and in no time, they even opened up their, you know, uh, their livelihoods as, as it were and life was getting back to normal. A similar trend was observed in the UK vaccination rates went very quickly, very high, and life was about, just about to get back to normal. But what have we seen happening recently? What has happened recently? New infections have started coming up. That, I, that's, that's even the reason why the UK had to delay the reopening uh, to, I guess, just early this week. The, it was supposed to have opened much, much earlier, but the cases started increasing up to 32,000 new cases per day. What does that tell us? What does that show? It means 
just to echo the point that Dr. David has mentioned, it means that as long as there are people around the world that are not fully vaccinated, that are not fully protected, we are just going to continue going around in circles. The variants have made that very, very clear. And now the, the, the issue is even going around, you know, what is the current efficacy of these vaccines that have been used? You see, the, the target is now shifting. People are already vaccinated, and now they're talking about boosters, right? So how many boosters are you going to give? How many boosters are, are we going to be giving? Isn't it even much easier that we target full global vaccination and forget about you know, these variants that are going to be emerging? And the, the other point to, to highlight from the you know, uh, biochemistry or molecular biology point of view is that if you are in a population, or I'm, in this case, I'm considering the, the global population, if you are in a population where there are some people who are vaccinated and there are some people who are not vaccinated, this creates a selection pressure, right? So you are actually going to be now dealing with uh, a virus that is going to mutate so that it can survive in such an environment. And th this, this happens, it's a natural order of things. Uh, these viruses will continue to evolve and ultimately they'll continue to escape vaccines. We can make as many vaccines as we want, but as long as we're going to be having people who are not vaccinated, we should expect that we're going to be having new variants, new strains that will be emerging. We, we, will, we will actually exhaust the entire alphabet. We are now at Delta and very soon we'll, we'll finish it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. De um, Deplay, did you have anything else to add or you? Um... So for, yeah, for me, one, one very, very important um, uh, aspect to consider the inclusion of, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, volunteers from uh, Africa is actually to think in terms of the practicalities. How do we include volunteers from uh, Africa uh, ethically, right? Uh, in trials that are happening uh, in the UK, so that at the end of the day, no one is going to say that uh, this particular trial has been taking advantage of the situation uh, in Africa. So that at the end of the day, no one is going to point at uh, the researchers and say that they actually exploited, uh, you know, uh, volunteers from uh, Africa. It's pleasant to know that uh, they are close to 2,000, uh, you know, uh, individuals from uh, African countries that have already volunteered to participate in uh, uh, COVID-19 human challenge uh, trials. These are individuals who are not expecting uh, to benefit in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know dollars or British pounds, but these are individuals who feel that they can make a contribution in this fight against COVID-19. So to me, I think it's very very important that as society, we look, we look into how we can ethically involve uh, those volunteers uh, in these uh, clinical uh, trials. And, and how would you say we can? What, what would your, where would you start? So for me, um, I've been thinking about uh, this uh, uh, and I see uh, several ways of uh, involving uh, uh, volunteers from African countries. So the first one might actually be to establish uh, a site uh, in, uh, let's say, one African uh, city uh, where we have uh, people from uh, various uh, countries coming to volunteer because with human uh, challenge trials, you are looking at uh, people actually staying within a facility for a short period of time. And once they are done, then they can actually go back to uh, their countries. But that actually means uh, putting some resources to, uh, let's say, renovate um, a facility which is already in, in uh, which is already existing in Africa to ensure that it meets uh, the standards that are expected, the safety standards that are expected uh, for human challenge trials. And then, of course, the other uh, option would actually be to have uh, volunteers who are coming uh, from uh, um, Africa in an organized way uh, to participate uh, in uh, the trials. The third option would actually be to reach out 
to uh, you know uh, uh, people of African uh, origin who are within uh, Europe, right? And uh, with their involvement, you're actually uh, representing uh, people who are on the African uh, continent uh, through those. Because for uh, human challenge trials, you actually need smaller numbers as uh, compared to uh, field trials. So these are some of the approaches that I've been, uh, you know, thinking about. Yeah, and uh, in addition to what uh, what has been mentioned, another or other points that could be considered from, uh, on how this could be done is uh, collaboration uh, or, or partnerships. I think there's there's lots of research going on in different parts of the world, and if if the problem in this issue of diversity for these challenge trials is that we can't have Africans, uh, you know, participate in a trial being run in, in the UK, right? What is wrong with the collaboration where uh, African universities and UK universities partner in this kind of research? They, they share data, they, they do the ethical, you know, uh, considerations if it, it means uh, applying for, you know, uh, regulation authority authorization, this is done. But the point is, if an African university here on the African continent is, is partnering with a university in the UK for this particular uh, study, I think would be, would actually get rid of many of the ethical issues being raised. The second way is to empower, you know, the African volunteers with, you know, the, the agency. And what I imagine is the best way to have this done is to allow volunteers themselves to speak out what they want to do, why they want to do it. For example, the way you see, the way you see I'm, I'm talking here as a volunteer. In fact, when I, when I signed up, the first time I, I saw uh, One Day Sooner, it was on BBC. And after, after, after reading through, I thought, huh, there's a way I can help. And frankly speaking, I didn't, I didn't even know about the money issue. I didn't even know volunteers would be paid. You know, the, the point being that there are many people in different parts of the world, not just Africa, who are actually desirous to help. So this advocacy must be allowed for them to speak because the, the impression being painted from, you know, from Europe or from, from America is that the African volunteers or people from Africa are going to be you know, exploited, they're going to be taken advantage of, they, they, they are victims. We are not victims. We are not victims. I'm not a victim. I want to do my part in helping end the pandemic. That's it. And there are others around, around the world, around the continent who want to do the same. So this advocacy must be run by volunteers. And African researchers also must be empowered. Most of the research which has gone on in COVID-19 has exclusively uh, been from, from the West, but we have African researchers, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a world where African researchers are also uh, empowered, motivated, and regional bodies like the African Union, for example, needed to take an active role in this. We need to be thinking as a continent of even future pandemics to be contributing to the research of, towards pandemics or, or epidemics. The African Union could set up a research facility that allows African researchers to work on diseases that are affecting people on the continent. But our researchers are not given this, uh, this mantle, they're not given the, the empowerment that they need. So I think those are my three points on the collaboration with, between universities for this research allowing volunteer advocacy so that we are not painted as victims. We are not abused, we are not victims. We want to do our part for the science and empowering African researchers from, from those angles. Thank you very much, Zachariah. Um, on the link, I'm going to, um, sorry, on the link, on the chat, I'm going to attach a link about Zachariah's article on the importance of Africa research as opposed to relying on the West. Um, there you go. Um, I'd also, as we're coming up closer to the end, I'd like to remind 
um, all of you watching that you can submit your questions in and we'll get to them um, towards the end. Thank you. So um, I think I'd also like to give um, doc Dr. Um, Deble the opportunity to talk about his paper, um, Protections for Clinical Trials in Low and Middle Income Countries Need Strengthening, Not Weakening. So um, it mentions, and this is for context um, for those watching, um, it mentions the Declaration of Helsinki, which was adopted um, by the World Medical Association in 1964 to guide the ethical conduct of medical research. So um, in it, um, Dr. Deble, you, you discuss how the 2008 revision of the declaration specifies that research participants are entitled to share the benefits from the studies in which they participate. Um, can you just uh, elaborate a bit more on perhaps maybe the disparity in how considering the vaccinate the scale of vaccination in the UK, it's the benefit, um, the UK volunteers won't benefit as much whilst the, um, whilst Af volunteers from Africa, for example, would, would you argue that should be a heavy, a heavily considered factor into bringing people over or not? Yep. So I want to start by uh, going back to the point that was uh, raised by uh, Zach. You are seeing that the, this uh, uh, volunteering, it's actually through altruism, right? There is a sense in him that he wants to play an important role in terms of uh, being part of uh, the solution. So if I'm looking at people who volunteer to participate in uh, human challenge trials and in phase one trials, right? These should be people that we, uh, we appreciate for playing that sacrificial role, if I can, if I can put it uh, that way. So uh, when I'm looking at uh, benefits, I would say benefits come as the next step. But the first step is this clear understanding of what you as an individual are getting yourself into. So this is why I always want to emphasize on the issue of informed consent. That informed consent is not just about fulfilling those uh, elements that are written in the US regulations or in the British regulations or in the uh, guidance from uh, the, uh, the, the IRBs. But informed consent is about appreciating the implications of participation in a, club, in a trial. If you know what it means for you as an individual to participate in a trial and then you agree to participate in that trial, to me I'm saying that you are someone who fully understands what uh, trial participation means. So when I'm then looking at issues of uh, benefits to uh, the individuals, still when you're looking at even someone who is participating uh, who is, uh, from uh, the, the, the British uh, community who is participating, there are also other benefits that can be added uh, into the trial uh, that are direct uh, to them as individuals, including uh, the, the individualized care that they will be receiving because basically they go through lots of uh, you know, tests, including also even the ancillary care that might be part of uh, that particular package. But now when I move to the other side, uh, across the ocean, if I'm looking at someone who is coming from uh, Africa, who has not yet been vaccinated, to me I'm saying when they are done with their participation after three weeks uh, of participation in this human challenge uh, trial, it is now time for them to be vaccinated, right? using what has already been proven to work. In this particular case, we might even be uh, insisting on the mRNA you know, vaccines because we're dealing with a smaller you know, uh, group of individuals. So it's actually easy for us even to administer uh, the, the most effective uh, vaccines to those particular individuals. And then we say, thank you for the part that you have played. And then they are going back. So there are so many ways in which we can build in some direct benefits uh, to, uh, to those individuals who participate. But more importantly, I am looking at uh, altruism being the, uh, the main uh, motivation. Um, Zachariah, would you like to contribute before we move on to the um, questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I think uh, regarding the Helsinki Declaration, I think for me, the easiest, perhaps uh, maybe a little naive way to look at it is 
as long as the virus is around somewhere, no one is safe. So the benefit is actually equal. It's, it's, it's a balance. As long as there's people, there are people who are not vaccinated, even if you're currently vaccinated, you are not safe. So the issue of uh, the social value or the benefit from the, from the say challenge trials should apply equally to everyone as long as there are individuals who are not vaccinated. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So one of the questions we have um, submitted in is asking, uh, what's the best explanation for why diversity in challenge trials is scientifically important, despite the small number of participants and the associated difficulty of identifying which, if any, participant characteristics lead to difference in the vaccine's efficacy? I could, I could start from my, my lay position and uh, say that uh, even if you are looking at a small population of, let's say, uh, 60 or 100 individuals, right? The way you collect the specimens in a human challenge trial, the people are actually staying within a facility. So it actually means you've got more data on each and every one of them, right? Because you are collecting specimens before uh, you actually expose them uh, immediately after and then two hours after. So you actually get to know more about how, uh, you know, uh, the human body is uh, reacting to uh, the, the, the challenge itself. So I would actually say that even based on those few individuals, you collect so much data, right? So now you know that this one is, uh, is uh, from Africa. Let's say you've got uh, uh, two people from Africa or three people from Africa. And then you see that they've uh, reacted the same way. Already you can actually generalize even from those uh, three people. Because the amount of data that you have and the confidence that you have because you're actually observing these individuals, uh, the environment is so controlled, right? So you can actually uh, you know, work with uh, confidence with uh, such findings. I'll leave uh, Zach to answer in a definite way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, that's a very good question. First of all, it is true that in, in human challenge trials and or basically in controlled human infection models, the numbers for participants are usually low. But in no way does that um, justify or necessitate that some groups should be excluded. Now, I mentioned this earlier that uh, the basic principles in biostatistics when it comes to sampling, which is what is done when selecting you know, the, 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 the team or the, the trial participants for a, for a research study. These principles are that the, the sample which is picked, first of all, must be random. And the point I've been emphasizing is that the sample which is picked must be truly representative of the population from which it is selected. And secondly, the population to which those results are to be applied. Now, the, the numbers, yes, are small, but there is actually a worse uh, problem created if you decide to leave out certain groups of people just because the numbers are small, you're actually worsening the quality of your data that, that you ultimately get from, from those results because the data is not going to be truly representative. That, that's for sure. And secondly, you are likely to leave out very, very key findings from an excluded sample or from a different location, which is what we must avoid when it comes to biomedical research. Because as long as we don't get the full scope of the data that we're looking for in a research, it means there is things we will not understand about the disease. There is things we will not understand about the virus and ultimately how to deal with it and what can happen if, for example, someone is exposed. So the reason why all these clinical trials are being done, why this research is being done, is for us to get a better understanding of the virus we are facing in this case or the disease that we are facing so that we can best decide the way to handle it. So by leaving out a group, we are leaving out certain pieces of information that would ultimately be very useful. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is that once we leave out certain groups, we don't even know what we are missing, right? So we'll create a picture which we think is the perfect uh, picture. Meanwhile, there is a lot that we have left out because of our error in the sampling uh, process. So uh, I guess that's, uh, uh, that's the way I would, uh, I would respond to, uh, to that question. 
And then maybe just to, uh, to touch a little bit, I've just talked about the scientific value, just to touch a little bit, yes, it's true that it would be difficult um, in identifying uh, these characteristics, but in general, when a study is being designed, the, the protocol is going to have a criteria. Now, obviously, for example, just to give an example, in the COVID-19 Human Challenge Trials, you'll be looking, for example, uh, for, for healthy adults. That's the criteria, right? Uh, what does it mean to have a healthy adult? Perhaps since this is a, a COVID-19, you may be thinking about people who do not smoke, for example, or, you know, who are not exposed to smoke. They're not uh, maybe abusers of alcohol, for example. They don't have existing comorbidities, for example. So these are actually the characteristics that you will be using for selecting or identifying your participants. Now, the problem comes in when race is included as a criteria. It has been said before that race is not scientific. It's a social construct. It's simply how society views certain individuals. That's it, right? So as far as the science is concerned, we are human beings and that's it. So if a person, regardless of where they are, regardless of how they look like, as long as they fit this criteria that we're talking about in terms of our uh, age, in terms of uh, uh, comorbidities, in terms of, uh, you know, the things that we've mentioned already, then those people should qualify. Those are characteristics that should be used to identify, it, say, uh, said participants. And beyond that, as, as Dr. Ndebele had mentioned earlier, the selection criteria is not absolute. It's just a screening process. After that, there is a further screening and bio biochemical testing that will be done to actually see if what is answered in a survey is accurate according to you know the, the biochemistry. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Yeah, exactly out of time. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Hopefully we can get those answers to you at one point. We'll ask our panelists and, or just kidnap Zachariah, that's fine. And um, send the answers through an email or a follow-up email and um, so and with that I would like to thank uh, thank Dr um, Deble for uh, and Zachariah for their time um, as well as Monde Suna and our events coordinator Danny um, who's behind the scenes and um, helping me out um, I hope this discussion has been thought-provoking and inspires further debate on diversity in human challenge trials um, thank you everyone uh, stay safe and goodbye thank you thank you